This is a translation from a recorded talk. And so it's May, and it's close to the day um, that the Buddha attained to awakening, uh, this day of Visaka uh, Puja. And so when the Buddha was born, he studied and went to school. And he studied the various sciences and arts um, that were taught in those days. And he succeeded in those um, higher than anyone else who was learning in the Sakyan clan. And uh, even though he studied these subjects, there was also this deep search within his heart and this very deep thinking that was going on from the feelings that he had there, and the feeling that he needed uh, to become the Buddha, that he needed to know uh, these noble truths, the Dhamma. And so the Buddha, after studying, he saw these deva dutas, these heavenly messengers, and uh, so deva, we could translate that as being something noble, and uh, dutta is a messenger. And these four deva dutas uh, were an old person, a sick person, a dead person, and a samana, a recluse. And even though his father, King Sudotana, had tried to cover these sights from him, had just wanted the prince to see only good things. And he even kept away the elder family members from his sight so that he wouldn't become tired of the world. He couldn't, we wouldn't, he wouldn't become weary. And uh, he even built a palace, or, or three palaces for each uh, season. And then he later got married to his wife, uh, Pimpa. And due to the barami that he had developed uh, to a full level already, there wasn't anything that was able to pull him in, that was able to restrain him, because his wisdom was so, was so sharp. And he just needed to see this old age, sickness and death, and this came within him, that he reflected upon this within himself. And he saw the suffering there within the world. And he saw that I too have been born, and so I need to be like this. And that's what he asked um, his charioteer. He said, well, will all of us be like this next? He saw someone sick, and they were in pain. There was a lot of torture in their bodies. And will I be like this as well? He saw someone dead, and he asked, her, will my life have to end in this way as well? And he asked his charioteer, Channa, this, um, who had taken him out of the palace, and he responded that, yes, both you and I must be like this, that all people who are born into this world, all of us die, all of us get old, all of us get sick, and all of your family members, everyone in the Sakyan clan, they must be like this as well. And so Prince Siddhartha, he contemplated, and uh, he saw this, that, I too must be this way, even though I have everything. I have a lot of happiness. I have everything that I could really want. But one day that I'll have to be separated from these things that I like, from the people that I love. And so he contemplated this, the difficulty in the world, the suffering in the world, and that whenever there's birth, and then there's old age, sickness, and death, and these two things, they come as pairs. But he thought further than that, he contemplated further, and he saw that if there's birth, there also needs to be something which isn't born. And these two also must come in a pair. And the fact that he was able to think these thoughts showed that he had a lot of barami that since there's birth, there's old age, sickness, and death. And so if one isn't born, then there won't be old age, there won't be sickness, there won't be death. And this too must exist. And so we try to find that path that leads to not getting born. And that's really not easy to find. 
We need methods to get there. And in the Buddha's time, uh, the methods mostly were to torture oneself. And the idea was that if we did this, then that would free the mind, and the mind would be awakened. So the Buddha rode as a prince. Um, he rode on his horse, uh, Kandaka, and went out to ordain. He cut his hair next to the river, and his charioteer, Chana, took his jewelry and then gave that back to his father, the king. And then he went out to practice ascetic practices for six years. And there were many people at that time who had very deep samadhi, that gained these deep jhanas, and they were respected by the people. And they could also torture their bodies, or some of them would just go into these very deep jhanas. And so the Buddha studied with two of these teachers. There was Alara Kalama and Uddhika Ramaputta. And uh, he studied the jhanas with them. And so the first jhana has the factors of vitaka, vichara, piti, sukha, ekakata, uh, the initial and sustained application of the mind, and then rapture, happiness, and one-pointedness. And then went into second jhana uh, with joy, happiness, and one-pointedness. And then third jhana with happiness and one-pointedness. And then the fourth uh, with just this pure collectedness of mind. And these are the rupa jhanas, the jhanas with form. And there's also ahrupa jhanas, the formless jhanas. And these are very deep levels of samadhi where one isn't focusing on any form, but rather they focus on mental qualities, and it's a more subtle level. So we take Vedana, these feelings, perception, mental formations, or sense consciousness as the object. And the mind's in a very subtle state when it reaches these. And even though the Buddha could get into these states, still he hadn't attained. Even though... They said that that's what would happen, one would gain awakening, but that didn't happen, he didn't reach awakening. So not long after the Buddha studied with these teachers, he was able to fulfill what they could teach him. And they wanted to appoint him as a teacher, but he didn't accept, he didn't want that, because he could see that this wasn't the way out of suffering, that there was still suffering there. And so he went to practice these severe ascetic practices to torture his body. And he went into a cave in a mountain. And he practiced in a way that no one else would be able to do. He went without food. He stopped breathing uh, for periods. And his body became incredibly emaciated. And he used the power of his deep jhanas and the power of his barami as a bodhisattva to do this. And that's what allowed him to survive, that he didn't die due to these practices, but at the same time, he also wasn't awakened. So we see that the path to knowledge, the path to attaining to the Dharma, to freedom from suffering, this is really something that's not easy at all to find even though there were many, many people who had gone out, given up the home life, and gone in search of this path, there was no one who was able to find it. Many sought it out, but none came across it. And that was because their barami, these virtues, uh, spiritual virtues, they weren't to that point yet. They weren't enough. But our Buddha, he had developed these Bharamis as a Bodhisattva for a very long time, and they had reached a stage of fullness. Developed this Bharami of generosity, and it wasn't just the normal level of Bharami, but it was the Paramatta Bharami, the highest, the supreme Bharami. In that he had offered his life, he'd given up his life, he'd given up the parts of his bodies for many, many lives. His such a barami that he was willing to sacrifice his life in the name of truth. 
And so we've studied these before, these ten bharamis. And when we take them in their three levels, it's thirty bharami. So there's kanti bharami, the bharami of patient endurance, and then virya, that of persistence or effort, and satcha, truthfulness, upeka, equanimity, metta, loving kindness, sila, virtue, nekama, renunciation, dana, generosity, apanya, is wisdom. And he developed all of them to the highest level, that they were complete and full already. So there are these 30 levels. Now there's the normal level, there's 10 of those. And then there's the higher level, and there's 10. And then there's the ultimate level, there's 10. So that means uh, 30 barami. Now the Buddha developed these, and then he came to contemplate So on the 15th day of the 6th lunar month, he crossed over the Naranjara River. This is a green river, that's what the name means. And he crossed over this and he sat underneath the Bodhi tree on the other side and faced the east. And he went into first jhana, and that first jhana, then the first knowledge arose within him. This was knowledge into the past, of what he had been in the past. And for us, we often wish to know this. What were we in our previous lives? And what happened in the past? What did we become? But the Buddha, he knew all of this, and there was nothing that could obscure his vision. He knew all of his past lives. He could see way back and through the past, or the times he'd been born, or the times that he had died, that this went back and back and back for a very long time, a countless length of time, for countless lifetimes. And he could recollect these hundreds of lives, millions of lives, and no matter how far he went back, there were still lives before that. So this was from 6pm until 10pm that he recollected this. And then from 10pm until 2am, there was the second knowledge, the second jnana that came up. And so for us, we often wonder about this, that there are people who are born into this world, but we differ. And some people, they do a lot of good things in this life, but they don't seem to get many good things in return. There are many people who do a lot of bad things, but they get good things. And we're in doubt as to why that's the case. Some people harm many animals and other beings, but... We're confused as to why it is that they live to a ripe old age. And so many people ask this. This is a question, a doubt, which is there within people's minds. And we can give them the answer that it's due to being's karma. And even though they may understand this to one degree, it's often not clear within their hearts. But within the Buddha's heart, this was crystal, crystal clear. This issue, he could see it or and see it within himself, see it for other beings, other animals. And he knew that when people died, then sometimes they got born as an animal, sometimes they got born lower than that state, sometimes as a human, sometimes as a deva. And then devas, sometimes they got reborn as humans after they passed away. And he could see clearly, and he knew what caused these births to happen that there were causes and then the results come from that. So his mind was very still and peaceful in samadhi during this time. And he could recollect these past lives. And he could recollect and know uh, what karma uh, produced beings to be born. Even though he gained these knowledges, he still hadn't succeeded in his aim. And this came about when he contemplated into dependent co-arising. That there's ignorance, and then from that there's craving, and there's clinging. And this is what causes suffering. And this all happens within the hearts of humans. And you could see this clearly, these ten stages of this dependent co-arising. And what causes what to happen. And so it was at dawn that this knowledge was complete and he awakened. At this point, the three great virtues of the Buddha came together. His great wisdom, his great purity, his great compassion. 
These are the things which he had been building already, but they gathered together, they came together at this point, because it was the wisdom that allowed him to destroy all of the kilesas, the defilements there within his heart, so that his heart could gain this quality of purity. This happened underneath the Bodhi tree. And then it was his boundless compassion that brought him to teach. In the beginning he started teaching the five ascetics, and they first awakened to Sotapanna and then to Arahantship. So on this day of Visaka, this is the day that the Buddha awakened. For us, we have been born into this world. We're Buddhists, we've gained a human body. But what about our minds? And what level are our minds? And we know that we have this body and we also have a mind which receives these sense impressions. We have this external body, and the mind comes and attaches to this. It attaches to everything within it, all of it it takes to be me and to be mine. And so this is the outer body, this coarse body. But there's also an inner body as well, a subtle body. And this is one which our minds aren't able to see. They just can't perceive this inner body. It's not something that we're able to see with the eyes of our flesh. So this inner body is the mind. So we see that sometimes we have virtue, we're virtuous, and our eyes are very bright and clear. And so our bodies and our hearts, they both have the quality of goodness within them. There's humanity both within our physical form and within our minds as well. And if we develop our minds to be more good, to be higher, and they have these qualities of joy and happiness within them, then they become a deva. And if we develop this a lot, if we keep the mind in this state through cultivating generosity, virtue and meditation, then the mind will always be in the state of a celestial being. This inner body will always be in that state, will always be a deva. But if we don't have sila dhamma, we don't have this virtue, then our inner body will drop, it'll get lower and lower, it'll get more and more coarse. And when the inner body is more coarse, then our external body becomes coarse as well, it gets lower and lower as well. So both these inner and external bodies are connected to each other. For us, we have this good opportunity now. We've met with the teachings of the Buddha within this life. And so we should try, really put in our efforts, to develop our minds, to make them better. Make sure that through the day and through the night, we're becoming better. That today we're better than than we were yesterday. Even though we may have a lot of greed, hatred and delusion, but still we really put set our hearts on enduring, and bring up this quality of endurance first. Make sure we keep our virtue, our precepts, well. And through doing this, we're developing our barami. And we also develop the other baramis as well, um, generosity, for example. And when we're generous in a consistent way, then we'll be experiencing happiness, and that's the result that we get from our generosity. So these results, they arise within ourselves first, within our hearts first, and that when we're generous, then we feel happy within ourselves. This happiness comes from the sacrifice, from the goodness that we've done. But when our karma kind of bears fruit, then that's when we'll get the external results too. And the external results of generosity is that of gaining things, of having wealth, of having possessions. So some people these days, they like to teach in a way that makes people think that they'll get things very quickly. That if we pay homage to the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, or praise devas, offer things to devas, then we'll get really quick results from that. That these results will just kind of magically appear. But they don't really teach that these things must come from the goodness that we create. 
that we need to build up this goodness first, that we need to have this foundation there first. And from that goodness, from all of that which we have created, then these good results will appear. So like Lady Visako or Ananda Pindaka, they had created a lot of merit in their previous lives. And so when they were born during the Buddha's time, then they had everything that they needed. Or with Venerable Sivali, that he had been very generous uh, before, and that's why he was able to gain so many things um, as a monk. But within the Buddha's teachings, there's nothing there which tells us that if we just wish for something, or if we just do something small, if we worship some holy object, and we make a request, then suddenly we're going to get rich, that these things just appear, that we get born in this life, and we're born just as a very wealthy uh, person in, a, in the family of millionaires. That isn't there within the teachings of the Buddha. The Buddha taught us about karma, about our actions, that all the things which appear have causes which bring them into being. And that's what we can say that the Buddhist religion is about. It's a religion of cause and effect. It's a religion of reason. And we can also say that uh, Buddhism is a religion of knowledge. That's what Buddha means, is this awakening, knowing. And so there are things which cause suffering. And if we don't do those things, then we'll experience happiness. So sometimes people from overseas, they can wonder what it is that the Buddha taught and how one becomes a Buddhist. But even if one doesn't call oneself a Buddhist, but one practices in line with the Buddha's teaching, one does these things, then it's possible for this inner Buddha to arise within one's heart. And even though people may call themselves Buddhists, and they know what the Buddha taught, but they don't do it, they don't follow his teachings, then they'll never meet with this inner Buddha, with awakening. But it's when we follow these teachings, that's when this Buddha nature can come to fruit within the heart. So the Buddha taught about this. He taught about our actions, and he taught that things just don't magically appear. Just like how he said that studying well and gaining knowledge, this is one of the highest blessings in our lives. Because we see that if we have knowledge, and if we've studied, then this is what will allow us to have the things that we need in this life, or allow us to become wealthy. Just like someone who has studied um, medicine, and they're a very skilled physician. And wherever they go, then they'll be in demand, that people will want them to use their services, they'll want them to come and treat them. And wherever they go, they'll be received. And so these things, they come from what we've studied. They come from the goodness we've created, and from the Dhamma that's there within the heart. So if we want to gain things, if we want for our lives to be complete, to have everything that we need, and we want, We need to build these first. We need to build the causes and conditions, and that is merit and skillfulness. We need to have mindfulness. We need to have wisdom. We need to study well. We need to gain knowledge. And this is what will make things complete. It's not that we just go to some holy object and we make a request, we plead uh, to it, and we expect to get results magically appeared for us. That's not right, that's not correct. What the Buddha taught is that we need to put the causes and conditions in place. And from those, then the results will appear. If we put the causes for happiness into place, then we will experience happiness. So for us who are practicing as lay people, we need to really be firm in this, to be building up goodness, to be building merit, to be building our barami to be cultivating generosity, virtue, and meditation. And we want for the mind to be peaceful. But it's not that we just plead, I want peace, I want peace, may my mind be peaceful, may it be peaceful. 
And then we don't practice, we don't do anything. We just carry on allowing the mind to think as it wants, and it's just chaotic. And then we ask why it is that we're asking for help, but these holy objects, they're not giving us any help, they're not allowing our minds to be peaceful. The Buddha taught us that he was just the one who points the way, and we all need to practice for ourselves. And when we do this practice, then we will gain peace. If there's food there, but we don't eat it, how is it that we'll possibly ever get full? And so if if there's goodness and we do it, then we'll experience happiness. So we need to be really firm in this, to be building up goodness, to collect up this goodness through being generous, through our virtue, through our meditation. Because this path of dana, sila, bhavana is that which will take us out of suffering. We need to build up wisdom so that we're able to let go of our emotions and these sense impressions. We need to come and look at our minds, to contemplate these minds. Know what it is that they're thinking, to be following up on them. What are they attaching to? And then we teach our minds to not attach, to not cling to those things. And so we care for our minds in this way. And it's just like a cow herd uh, looking after their cows, that if they just let them go to do whatever they want, then they'll go right into the rice paddy and eat all the rice. And there'll be a lot of waste and destruction that comes from that. And so that person needs to be looking after those cows, needs to be tugging on their ropes occasionally, needs to be shouting at them every now and then. And in the same way, we have our mindfulness there, looking at our minds. Where are they going to? What are they thinking about? What are they attaching to? And then we contemplate so that we're able to let go, let go of physical things, let go of mental things, by seeing that all physical and mental things are stressful or unstable or not self. So we're always following up, looking um, after our minds. And this is citta, nupasana, satipatthana, and this Foundation of mindfulness, taking the mind as a foundation, following up on our minds, what are they thinking about, how are they feeling, caring for our minds, looking after them, contemplating them, seeing that the mind is just a mind, it's not a being, it's not a self, it's not me, it's not other. Even though it may be very good, we don't attach to that goodness. Even though the mind may be bad, we don't attach to that badness, or the mind that's in that state but rather we bring up our mindfulness here and make ourselves wise towards our minds. And we don't attach to them as being me. We let go of them. Because if we attach to this mind and we identify with it, then suffering will arise. And even though there may be goodness, that goodness can become a cause for suffering if we attach to it. Because people may say that what we're doing is bad and then we make it angry. So we shouldn't attach, we should let go. And if we can do that, then suffering can't arise. So always be following up on your mind, be looking after it, be caring for it. And do this a lot, practice in this way. So that the mind can become good, so that it become bright, so that it can become beautiful. And we do this through developing merit, through developing skillfulness. And this is what will give us happiness. This is what will allow us to grow and to develop. And so may all of you grow in blessings.